I hope you won't stop coming to visit now you're getting older. The bedside lamp cast Grandma in a sickly yellow glow. It made her look like she was wearing a Halloween mask. There was a smile on her face that didn't quite reach her eyes. The duvet covers rustled around me as Grandma shifted her weight on the bed. I frowned up at her. The last few times I'd been around to visit, she'd made similar comments to this one. Remarks about feeling lonely or not having enough people to talk to. Something was obviously on her mind. What? Of course I won't stop coming to visit Grandma, I said. Why would you think that? Oh, I don't know. You worry about these things when you get to my age. A smile widened for a moment, then faded. You worry people will forget about you. I haven't seen your brothers nearly as much since they started university, you know. I opened my mouth to respond to this, then closed it again. Grandma wasn't wrong. Dan and Rich were in different cities now, in their first and third years respectively. They definitely didn't see her as much. But then again, they didn't see any of us as much. I shifted in bed and propped myself up on one arm. Gave Grandma my best smile. Well, I promise I will always come round to visit anyway. Even in a few years, if I go to uni, I'll still come back. Grandma glanced from my face to the pillow beneath me, then back to my face again. She smiled, and this time, I thought it looked genuine. Even when you run out of tea? I always save my teeth for grandmas. It's like a tradition. My brothers and I have been doing it since we were little. Even if we lose a tooth at home, we'll keep a hold of it until we next visit her. Tuck the thing in our pocket and slip it under the pillow in grandma's spare room before bed. We never even had to tell her they're there. Somehow, she always seemed to know. She always pays well too. That's the main thing. I got five pounds for my first few teeth, and that jumped to ten pounds when I hit my teens. Recently, now that my brothers are away, and I'm the only one still at home, it's hit the twenty pound mark. Losing my milk teeth has been an uncomfortable, drawn out process. It's been going on for ages. My brothers had all theirs out by thirteen, but I'm fifteen now, and I only just lost my last molar. Finally worked the thing loose during maths the other day, it was painful, but worth it. I slipped it straight into my wallet to keep it safe. It's sort of amazing. But even though I must have put about 20 teeth beneath a pillow at Grandma's house, I've never once seen her taking them. I've never caught her in the act. She must wait until I'm dead asleep every night and tiptoe in without turning the light on. She must hardly make any noise at all. I go to sleep with a tooth underneath me and wake to find the money. It's always the same. The only signs that anyone has been in the room at all. And this is another little tradition. There are messages in the ensuite bathroom. The words scrawled in lipstick on the mirror. Thank you for the tooth, they'll say. Spend the money wisely. Or, that tooth was just what I was looking for. Hope you enjoy your payment. I used to ask Grandma about the messages when I was younger, but she'd always feign confusion, told me she didn't know anything about them, said it had to be the Tooth Fairy. I woke to the sound of my door snicking shut. The room around me was a nest of black and grey shadows. I tried to blink the sleep out of my eyes, unsure for a moment where I was. Then I saw the familiar shape of the bedside table, my clothes folded on the floor at its foot, and I remembered. I was at Grandma's house, sleeping in a spare room, and from the look of the thick shadows around me, it was the middle of the night. Still half asleep, I swung my legs out of bed and onto the carpet, grabbed my phone from the bedside table, and tapped the little torch icon. I was operating on autopilot at this point. I could feel the urge to pee my bladder, and getting up to go to the toilet was all my sleep-fogged brain could think about.
I climbed out of bed and padded along the carpet over to the closed bedroom door. It was only when I gripped the handle that I suddenly remembered what had woken me. The noise. The soft click. Which could only have been made by the door closing. The same door I currently had my hand on. Grandma. It had to be. The noise I'd heard must have been Grandma sneaking out of my room after taking the tooth from under my pillow. Making a mental note to check for the money when I got back to bed, I twisted the handle. I opened the door as quietly as I could. I knew it was stupid, but there was a part of me that wanted to preserve the secrecy of Grandma's tradition. I'd heard her taking the tooth for the first time, but I didn't want her to know I'd heard her. For some reason, I had the idea that it might hurt her feelings. With this thought running through my sleep-muddled brain, I stepped through the bedroom door and out onto the landing. Then, I paused. At the far end of the corridor, I saw the briefest blur of movement, a shifting among the shadows. This was followed by another soft clicking sound, similar to the one that had woken me before. It was the noise of another door shutting, Grandma again. Only, if it was Grandma, why had she just gone through that door? The door at the far end of the landing, the one directly opposite where I stood, didn't lead to a bedroom or to the bathroom. It led to the airing cupboard. What was Grandma doing going into the airing cupboard at this time of night? For the first time since waking, I felt the faintest worm of unease in my stomach. There was no real reason for me to feel afraid, and it was only a vague feeling, but I still felt it. I felt confused too. But the main thing I felt was curiosity. Holding up my phone in front of me, I made my way slowly along the landing. The tiny torch carved a path through the darkness. Shadows fled the light. I tried to tread as carefully as possible, but the wooden floorboards beneath me creaked softly with each step I took. The noise made me wince. The creaks weren't loud, but in the silence of Grandma's house, they sounded loud. I passed the top of the staircase on my right, then the bathroom on the left. I didn't even glance at it. I still needed to pee, but the urge was no longer at the front of my mind. A moment after passing the bathroom, I reached the closed door of Grandma's bedroom. I paused there for a moment and listened, but there was no sound beyond it. Of course there's no sound, whispered a voice in my head. Grandma's not in a room, is she? You just heard her go into the airing cupboard. I kept walking. The closer I got to the door at the far end of the landing, the more careful I became. I slowed down trying to make every footstep as quiet as I could. By the time the light from my phone was spilling over the airing cupboard's closed door, I could feel my own heartbeat banging in my chest. I stood still in front of the door and pictured the cupboard beyond it. I'd only been there once or twice, but it wasn't hard to remember. The airing cupboard was a small space, mostly taken up by the boiler. A large metal cylinder that hangs in the humid darkness like a spaceship. A few shelves on the left are home to towels and spare sheets, and a few cleaning products line the floor below. That's it. Barely enough room in there for a person. I hesitated in the darkness of the landing, feeling another prickle of fear and confusion. What could Grandma be doing in there? The house around me was completely silent, I strained my ears for the sound of movement beyond the door, but the only thing I could hear was my own heartbeat. Or, at least, that was all I could hear at first. After a moment, my ears began to pick up another sound too. It was impossibly faint, but it was there. A soft, gentle rustle. Nearly lost beneath a thumping in my chest, 
coming from the far side of the airing cupboard's door. The fear in my stomach was threatening to get worse, and I made a decision right then, on the spur of the moment, that I'd stop it before it had the chance. This was getting ridiculous now. I knew I was only spooking myself, and that there wasn't really anything to be afraid of. I was only being stupid. Before I could think about it anymore, I reached out and yanked the door open. The first thing that hit me was the smell. The rank odour that poured from the cupboard in a thick wave. I wrinkled my nose, almost taking a step back. It smelled like bad breath. That was my first thought. It smelled like the whiff of a person standing too close to you before they've brushed their teeth. The stink of dry drool on your chin when you wake up in the morning. It was like that only stronger, much stronger. The stench hit me in a wall and I screwed my face up against it, but my disgust only lasted for a moment. The smell only held my attention for the briefest second before the sight of what was inside the cupboard shoved it from my mind. The cupboard's interior was almost exactly as I'd remembered it. There were shelves on the left containing rows of towels, white bedsheets in neat stacks. The light from my phone bounced off them and made them glow. The boiler glinted to the right, its metal bulk shining silver in the shadows. There was no sign of Grandma anywhere. That was the first thought that shot through my head. The small cupboard was empty. I'd seen the door close when I came out of the bedroom. I knew I had and I could have sworn I'd heard a rustling noise coming from inside a moment ago. But there was nobody here. As these thoughts were going through my mind, I continued to sweep the light from my phone over the cupboard's interior. I shone it down at the floor, where it picked out bottles of bleach and a dustpan and brush, then traced it up the length of the boiler's metal body. It was as the light reached the boiler's upper edge that I felt dread punch through my stomach like a fist. There was a skull in the cupboard. A human skull. It grinned back at me from the shadowy recesses behind the boiler, off-white bone glinting in the light from my phone. Terror rocked through me in a wave. If I'd had more breath in my lungs, I'd have screamed. Maybe I'd have run. But instead... I only stood there, frozen, staring dumbly at the horror picked out in the cupboard's shadows. It took me a moment to realize what was wrong with it. What was wrong with the thing lurking behind the boiler? Although the light from my phone was weak, it was strong enough to illuminate the skull's surface. It was strong enough to outline the shape of an open mouth and two gaping sockets. And it was also strong enough to show the many cracks running through the thing's surface, or at least what looked like cracks. As my eyes adjusted and the worst of my shock faded, I saw they weren't really cracks at all. They were edges. They were the edges of hundreds and hundreds of teeth, which had been slotted together to form the shape of a skull like some nightmare jigsaw puzzle. The sight of it made me feel ill. My scalp itched. For a moment, I was reminded of an x-ray image I'd been shown once in school, of a child's skull before the big teeth had been pushed through the gums. Clustered molars packed tight in the bone. The x-ray had made me feel sick then, and the memory made me feel worse now. As the light from my phone shuddered over the disgusting shape in the cupboard, a stray thought flashed madly across my mind. Well, I guess this explains the smell. Then, I saw the movement in the skull's right eye socket and stumbled back a step. Terror surged through me, even worse than before. Somehow, I kept the phone raised in front of me, but my hand shook so badly the light bounced everywhere. It juddered from the boiler back to the skull, 
Then once more over the black eye socket, where it picked out two tiny, glinting lights within. I pulled in a sharp breath. There were eyes within the eye. That's what I was looking at. A face within a face. Something moved in the shadows, inching forwards into the light cast by my phone. I caught a glimpse of glistening, needle-thin teeth and a pair of rustling, membranous wings. The insect-like body of a creature peering out at me from the gaping, dead socket. Then, my paralysis broke. And I ran. I wanted to tell myself it was only a dream. When I woke this morning in my grandma's spare room, light spilling in around the curtains, it even seemed possible that maybe it had just been a nightmare. The entire trip to the airing cupboard, the grim discovery I'd made in the shadows there, all of it. But then I heard a rustling noise below my pillow as I shifted my weight in bed. I reached below it and felt the note there. Notes, actually. When I pulled my hand out, I was clutching a crisp wad of twenties. That was when the worm of fear curled awake in my stomach again, when I felt the first whispers of dread creeping back in. That dread only got worse when I forced myself to get up out of bed, when I padded into the ensuite bathroom and flicked on the light switch. Grandma always left me such sweet messages. Her neat, slanted handwriting is always easy to spot, even when she's writing in lipstick. The message I found on the bathroom mirror this morning was in lipstick, but it wasn't Grandma's writing. It was scrawled in huge, ugly red capitals that took up the mirror's entire surface. Reading it, I felt myself grow cold. She won't be lonely anymore. She has a new grandchild now. You don't start out shooting snuff. You build up to it. To be honest, I never thought I'd let it get that far. And I wish I never did. I started out wanting to be a legit filmmaker, but that's a hard business to break into when you don't know the right people. Living on your own is expensive, and it gets humiliating to ask your parents to help covering your rent after the second time. My mom was always more than happy to help, but it wasn't like my parents were loaded, and I hated being a leech. Eating nothing but ramen noodles and cheap mac and cheese is its own kind of misery. Not to mention being unable to go out and do anything with friends. I mean, I survived, but I was miserable. So, when a chance to film a porno came up, I jumped at the chance. I told myself it would just be this once. Just this once, turn into one more time, then this would be the last time. And before I knew it, I started getting deeper and deeper into the taboo. Like Fifty Shades of Grey looked vanilla compared to some of the BDSM I was behind the camera for. I knew I was getting out of the realm of legal when I filmed a girl cutting open her arm and licking up the blood. I don't know what she was on, but she had to be on something to do all this while smiling and giggling. But that check felt so damn good, so I kept my mouth shut. I was finally in the black. I told myself, no one made to do those things, so what was the harm in it? Then one day, I was approached with a once-in-a-lifetime deal. I normally worked with my guy, Charlie. He got all the hookups for the weird stuff. One day, Charlie came over with this other guy I'd never met before, who introduced himself as Noel. Noel doesn't look how you're probably picturing someone in this scene. He was about five foot six and balding on top. He wore these round, wireframe glasses that made me think of a school teacher. The kind of teacher that everyone loved. The one that you couldn't wait for his class every day because he never assigned homework and let you listen to music while you worked. I'm a friend of your work, Frank. Can I call you Frank? 
Noel took out his wallet and counted a few hundred dollar bills. This is your signing bonus. Once the film is complete, I'll give you double that. My eyes nearly popped out of my head. How long is the filming going to be on for? I asked, already snatching up the money. Oh, just a day. Maybe two if we need to do reshoots. Don't worry, you'll be compensated if it takes any longer than it should. Noel extended his hand. What do you say? No hard feelings if you feel you're not up to the task. I shook Noel's hand and asked when I started. I figured it would just be over-the-top BDSM when I saw the set. All chains and brick. I had a few drinks with the other two male actors while we waited for the actress to make her appearance. Not gonna lie, I got Ted Bundy vibes from the guy calling himself Tommy, but Gabe seemed like another average fun guy. When I saw the actress get dragged in, I realized how very deep I was in over my head. Her mouth had been duct taped shut. She'd clearly been crying and looked pretty banged up. Noel followed the men, dragging her, and clapped his hands together. Let's get to work then. Frank, I'd like for you to focus a lot on her limbs. The commissioner is very into legs and arms. You'll only get one chance, but since this is your first time filming this sort of thing, I won't be too upset if it's not perfect. I should have just bolted then. Gave Noel his goddamn money and left. Gone to the cops. Gone to someone. Instead, I quietly sat behind the camera and treated it like any other thing I filmed. Lights, camera, action. I never knew the girl's name. Both Tommy and Gabe wore full leather masks and were armed with hand saws. I zoomed in as they started sawing through a shoulder. Drops of blood landed on the camera and I brushed them off without even thinking. I saw Noel nod approvingly at their natural motion. The arm fell to the ground and I panned over it nice and slow as it rested on the floor. They took off her other arm and both legs, her struggles slowly fading and her eyes fluttering shut by the time they got through the final femur. Tommy and Gabe stood up, bowed to the camera like they were on a stage play. And... cut. I had to run to the bathroom after that. I vomited for what felt like an hour. When I finally stumbled out, Noel handed me the rest of my payment. He patted my shoulder and helped escort me to my car. It's always hardest the first time. I bet you had dreams of filming the next summer blockbuster someday, he said. I didn't say anything, but I didn't need to. Noel just nodded. We all had dreams like that. Maybe if things turned out differently, we would have been working on one of those blockbusters together. I'll call you when I need your services again. I told myself that I wouldn't pick up the phone again when Noel called. But I did. I did 25 snuff films in total. The money felt so, so damn good. And after a while, you really do become desensitized to it all. For me, it just felt like I was in a dream. A dream with gore and guts and horrible, horrible things happening to people. But it wasn't happening to me. I just saw it through a lens. The 25th film was the one that finally made me quit. I was out drinking with my fellow crew members when Noel came up with this darling blonde on his shoulder. I don't know how he did it, as he was pretty average in appearance but Noel could get the hottest women. Gentlemen, this is Rada. Rada, this is Tommy, Gabe, and Frank, he said, gesturing to them all. Rada giggled and clapped. Noel tells me you are actors, she said, a Russian accent thick on her words. Gabe puffed up. Tommy and I are the actors. Frank's the cameraman, he said. Cameraman? She cocked her head to the side. Is it fun? She asked. I shrugged. Well, I like it. It pays the bills, I said. 
Very good, very good, Rada clapped before looking up at Noel. Could I be in a film? I've always wanted to be an actress. I nearly dropped my glass. I had to excuse myself from the table, unable to ignore that glint of darkness in Noel's smile. I got a text about 20 minutes later saying to head to the studio. I stopped by at home to change into clothes I didn't mind getting bloody before I walked over. Rada was clearly drunk as she teetered around the set. She poked at the chains on a wall and smiled. Am I a captive in your scene, Noel? She asked. That sounds about right. Noel helped her into the chains. Rada's innocent doe brown eyes looking excitedly around. This whole thing made me genuinely sick. It was one thing when they were terrified, begging for mercy and sobbing as they realized they were doomed. But the innocent expression on Rada's face, how clear it was that she had no idea what was going to happen. I almost walked out then. But then Noel slipped a few hundreds in my hand and I just got the camera ready. Now remember, Rada, you are terrified. You're in true fear of your life, as this man is about to gut you. Don't be afraid to scream, Noel said. Rada nodded. I can do that. I am very good at being scared, she said. Tommy snickered before he pulled on his leather mask. This is just too easy sometimes, he murmured to me. I just rolled my eyes. Lights, camera action. Rada's bubbly expression changed to one of true terror as Tommy walked into the camera. Please, why am I here? I want to go home, please, she said as a tear rolled down her cheek. Tommy twirled around the knife before sliding it down her front, slicing through the front of her dress. Rada whimpered and turned her face away. I'll do whatever you want. Please, take my money. Anything she begged. The knife nicked her skin, and I saw this brief moment of confusion before she began to struggle in earnest, realizing this wasn't just a movie anymore. Yet, unchain me. I don't like this game. Director, I don't want to play anymore, she shouted. The knife went into her stomach, and her breath caught before she screamed so loudly I felt my ears pop. Tommy sliced down her stomach, thrusting his hand inside to pull out her intestines. He held them in front of her eyes as she continued to scream actual bloody murder. Even Noel, who was typically quite passive during these scenes, winced and rubbed one of his ears. Radha's dying breath came as all her organs were spilled out in front of her. Tommy bowed for the camera. And cut. Incredible. Noel shook his head before he got up and threw Tommy a towel. You've outdone yourself. Tommy nodded before I heard a groan. Noel, can I go again? I can do better. I'm not lying when I say I literally peed my pants when I saw Radha's head roll back up, blinking a few times before her eyes focused on Noel. Tommy screamed like a schoolgirl as he scrambled away, ripping off his mask. How the hell? He yelped as Radha began to tug at her chains. The girl groaned before rolling her eyes and smashing her right hand against the wall. I heard bones crack before she pulled her mangled hand free. She did the same to the left, before she began the impossible task of shoving her organs inside her mangled torso. Scene. Sorry, your language is hard when I hurt. She grunted as she popped her large intestine back inside. Scene would look better, covered in my blood. I can be cleaned. She looked up with a smile as she attempted to pull her skin together. Noel got up from his chair. I saw him shake as he slowly approached this woman that should absolutely be dead. 
What are you? He said softly. Rada giggled. An actress, Noel. I want to be a very good actress. We filmed that scene three more times. Rada had to film the rest of the shots naked, but she didn't mind. Only thing that bothered her was how cold the stone under her ass was. But each time she'd get up, put herself back together, and we'd go again. I'd never filmed for so long before. Not for one of Noel's films. The sun was coming up when Noel finally said we were done. I was about to leave when Ryder stopped me. Can I see? She asked, snuggling into the shirt she'd stolen from Tommy. Swallowing, I let her have the camera and rewound to the final time we filmed, which Noel had said was going to be his best work yet. She watched, silently, nodding approvingly as Tommy tore out her heart and squeezed the beating organ in his hand. My expressions are believable? She asked. Does it really hurt you? I asked. Rada nodded. It hurts like it would if it would kill me. But like I said, I want to be an actress. Will I be famous in these films? I can change if director needs me to be a different girl. She looked so eager for my response. In certain circles, you'll be a star. I left that day and never went back. I never picked up Noel's phone calls. Charlie was as good as dead to me. I cut my lease early and am now living back with my parents in Ohio. I think I'll be going back to school. Go into something less bloody. Like accounting. My mum always wanted me to be an accountant. I never want to film anything again. Especially one of Noel's films. I wonder if Rod is starring in all his movies now. It's different for each person. And I'm not talking about something stupid like hydrate, get enough sleep, and learn to love yourself. I mean an actual recipe like you'd make in your kitchen. It's not something you can find. It comes to you, if you're looking for it, in the form of an index card slipped into your mailbox or in the frame of your door. I wasn't looking, not at first. Then my friend Susan's life turned around, and I mean it really turned around for her. Her breast cancer went into remission practically overnight. She'd been unemployed because cancer, but now she's got a new job that doubled her salary and she loves it. Then there's Eric, and while he didn't have as big of problems as Susan, he's just been chronically disappointed with how his life had turned out. We talked about it a lot before he got his card. He's a lot more upbeat now, and he started to pick up new hobbies, and he just seems happy. So, I asked him what changed, and he told me there's a recipe for happiness. He found out about this from Susan, so I talked to her too. I thought they were just pulling a prank on me, but then Laura and Sam found out about the recipe, and they received their index cards, and now things have changed for Laura at least. Sam died. I hadn't quite decided what I wanted to do when my index card arrived. I admit, I was thinking about it. Who doesn't want to be happy after all? The cost scared me a little. Okay, it scared me a lot. Seeing Eric smiling is great, but I keep staring at his ears where the earlobes are nearly clipped off in a straight line on both sides. He used his kitchen shears, he said, and he advised me to splurge on a really high-quality pair if I needed them. Then there's Susan, and while it's great she's not going to, you know, die, she also wears long sleeves all the time now to hide where she used a vegetable peeler to remove a strip of skin from her wrist to her shoulder. 
The first in this card wasn't too scary, at least. The instructions were written in pen in tidy handwriting. A list of ingredients, and then numbered steps. It was a symbolic sacrifice. I thought I'd just go ahead and make the recipe, because it wasn't that hard, and I could quit any time, and there didn't seem to be any consequences. Tim chickened out on the last card, and he's been fine. Other than the usual exhaustion from working two jobs, but that's nothing new. My first meal was a ravioli with a cream sauce garnished with a shredded letter from my grandma. She passed away five years ago. I'm not even that great of a cook, but I followed the instructions on the index card, exactly as they said, and it turned out great. I suppose I got lucky in that I only had to eat paper. Susan made a squash soup that included the ashes of a recently deceased dog. I didn't see any immediate results, which my friends assured me was normal. They told me to be patient and wait for the second card. I was miserable during this time. Knowing that I was on the path to being happy only made the annoyances in my life seem more unbearable. My job was unfulfilling. My co-workers bored me. I felt helpless to keep up with simple tasks, and my garden went unweeded. And really, what was the point? I couldn't keep it clear for more than a few days, and the garage continued to accumulate clutter, despite my resolve that this would be the year I'd organize it. Then I'd feel guilty for my own unhappiness, because really, my life wasn't that bad. So what right did I have to complain? It was like the promise of reprieve only heightened my misery. Every day, I came home and checked the mailbox, desperately hoping to find an index card. For weeks, I walked away from this ritual, despondent and disappointed, until my excitement faded entirely, and I began to loathe the ritual. I needn't have tortured myself so with the mailbox. The second recipe showed up on my bathroom counter. I found it when I went to brush my teeth before leaving for work. It took a while to find the nerve to procure the ingredients. The index card's instructions were explicit. Eric told me that when he got the second card, he was convinced he was going to get arrested. But he did exactly what the card said, and nothing bad happened. Nothing bad happened to him, at least. He had no idea what happened to the person he mugged and took their green card from. I think he feels guilty about it still. He gets uncomfortable talking about it, so I don't bring it up. My second recipe was a maple bourbon pumpkin pie, which is an interesting combination. It had a good taste, but the texture was unpleasant, on account of all the human hair in it. I feel bad for the lady that was out jogging. She was screaming hysterically and clutching at her hair after I jumped back into my car. Her ponytail clutched in my fist. But, like Eric, I haven't been caught. I just stood there, beside the path, staring at my phone. And when she passed, I reached out with one hand, grabbed her hair, and then cut it off with the scissors I had behind my back with the other. There had to have been over a foot of hair. It must have taken her years to grow it that long. Nothing changed in my life, except for the lingering guilt over what I did, of course. My stomach ached with it, although perhaps that was more because I'd eaten an entire pie. I began to look forward to the third and final card, and with that anticipation came a renewal of hope. I began to prepare for it, for when everything would change and I would finally be content and happy. I weeded my garden. I bought some shells for the garage. I was more pleased with my co-workers. And while they were still dull, and my job was still unrewarding, I at least found it was easier to ignore. The promise of happiness was like a lining over everything around me, causing it to glitter and shine. My friends even noticed the difference and asked if I'd gotten it, if I'd received the third card. Not yet, I tell them with a laugh. I'm still waiting. Then, it came. 
and I woke up and it was laying on my chest. I fumbled for the bedside light and read it, trembling with excitement. My friends had warned me that this would be the hardest one. I'd have to plan carefully, do it over a weekend and choose a time where I could take some days off work, make sure I had some money stashed away for the resulting medical bills for whatever insurance refused to cover. Most importantly, have first aid supplies nearby, because I wouldn't be able to go to the hospital right away. We'd learn this from Sam. The index card is explicit that the recipe has to be prepared in one go. You can't harvest the ingredients and come back later. Sam, well, Sam bled out while waiting for the tamales he'd stuffed with five inches of his intestine to steam. I suppose he made the incision too big. You know, that thick pad of muscle right at the base of the thumb? It's a group of muscles, one of which is called the abductor pollicis brevis. I had to look that phrase up to understand what the index card was telling me. I think I removed some of the neighbouring muscles as well by accident. I don't regret it. I didn't want to mess this up after all. And it was so hard to see what I was doing with all that blood and being dizzy from the pain. I thought I was going to pass out while the meat was simmering and I had to lean on the wall, stirring with my remaining good hand, taking deep breaths and telling myself to just bite through it. Just keep going because I was so close. I made a sloppy joe. I diced the muscle from my hand and mixed it with ground beef and sauce and served that up in a bun. I ate it voraciously, my stomach twisting with every bite, and I fought down the nausea when I was done. Then, after I swallowed the last of it, I called 911 and told them there'd been a kitchen accident and I was bleeding badly. I think I passed out after that, for I only remember bits and pieces of everything else. My memory clears much later. When I'm in the hospital bed, with a hand wrapped up and an IV dripping pain meds into my vein. The doctor told me there wasn't much they could do. The muscle was gone. The worst injury she'd ever seen in a kitchen, and they had nothing they could repair to restore function. That hand was crippled. I told her that it was okay, that I was going to be happy now. I think it was the pain meds that made me slightly delirious. She looked skeptical and went away. I am happy now. Sure, the thumb on my left hand doesn't work that well anymore, but I think that's such a small cost to have paid for what I got. Happiness is something we spend our whole lives chasing after all, and so few of us obtain it. So few of us even know what it feels like. Well. I can say confidently that I understand what it means to be happy. After I got out of the hospital, I applied for a new position, one that would be more people-oriented, so I wouldn't have to type as much. And I got it. I enjoy it. It's made me get to know my co-workers better, and they're not as insipid as I thought they were. I fix up the yard at home, so it looks nice when I have friends over now which is a lot more often because we're all happy and actually feel like doing things. Except Tim, on account of being miserable with his two jobs. I try to remember to invite him anyway, but sometimes I forget. Last we talked, he's reconsidering his index card. Because a teaspoon is such a small amount compared to how big an organ the liver is, really. It's such a small sacrifice. I tell myself this every day after I get up in the morning. I go look at myself in the mirror. I smile and I say that it was worth the price. I'm happy now, I tell myself. I mustn't ever forget that. I'm happy now and my sacrifice wasn't in vain. I wish I could tell you how to start this whole process, but I don't actually know. I started thinking how great it would be to finally be happy, truly happy, and a few days later, the index card was waiting for me. 
I guess the most advice I can give is if you're lucky enough to find a recipe in your mailbox, do whatever it says, whatever it tells you to give up, whatever it tells you to take from others, do it. It'll be worth it, you'll see. It will be worth it. Spending all waking hours in the pitch darkness does something to you. It messes with your head. Humans need sunlight. We're not meant to be nocturnal. And when that darkness turns on you, when it starts feeding on your sanity, when you start feeling too comfortable down there, that's when the horrors creep up on you. It wasn't supposed to be a career, you know. I just got bored with school, wanted to take a year off, earn some money, figure out what I wanted to do with my life. I got the job through family connections, that's how these things usually go. Waterproofing tunnels. It was merciless, hard labour, both physical and mentally, but it also paid extremely well. I'd spent a few months doing portal jobs, that's what we call tunnel entrances, before I was assigned to the subsea tunnel. The portals were pretty straightforward, but often extremely demanding physically, since we'd more often than not had to haul the gear on top of them ourselves. Drills, rolls of membranes, welding machines, all backbreakingly heavy stuff. So, I was pretty stoked when I got assigned an actual tunnel gig. The project was pretty hush-hush. We all had to sign fairly extensive NDAs before we got on the plane. Military-grade stuff. That's one of the reasons why I won't be disclosing the exact location of it. The other reason being that I don't want anyone finding out what we did. It is best left alone down there, in the depths. The tunnel wasn't supposed to be very long, about three miles, but there'll always be problems when you're digging through subsea rock foundations, so things moved along at a snail's pace. It also didn't help that the shift seemed to be hopelessly undermanned. I got there pretty late in development, and the gnome, a massive state-of-the-art drilling rig, was about halfway through when my foreman assigned us to our shifts. I was teamed up with a couple of veterans, some local teenagers on temporary contracts, and a new hire, Paul. Paul and I got along pretty well from the get-go. We were both fairly young, had much of the same taste in music, and we both had a laid-back mentality to life in general. The shifts were grueling, 12 hours in the depths, 6 days a week, then we'd have a day off to adjust from day shift to night shift, or vice versa. So, working with people you could tolerate became a prerequisite for sanity down there. I say down there, which might be confusing. Tunnels usually go through mountains, right? But, we're talking about subsea tunnels here. You can imagine the layout like a valley, going gradually down from the mainland to a certain depth deemed structurally safe, then gradually ascending the surface on the other side. The lowest point is called the sink, since all the water seeping through the foundations will end up there. A massive pumping system will have to be activated 24-7, pumping all the water back out, lest we all end up drowning and the tunnel caving in on itself. The lowest point in this particular tunnel was just short of half a mile under sea level, and the gnome had passed this point no more than a day before I started my first shift. Since both Paul and I were pretty new, and didn't have welding license yet, we were both assigned to ditch duty. The veterans hated ditch duty, but I found it quite relaxing, soothing even. I won't bore you with the details, but I can quickly explain what it entailed. In order to properly install the waterproof membranes, someone had to crawl into the ditch behind the tunnel elements and secure the membranes to the structure. It was a cold, wet, and dirty job, and it took 
goddamn forever. But you can move at your own pace, since no one wanted to go back there to check on you, listen to music, and if you didn't mind the solitude and pitch blackness, it was a fairly chill job, all things considered. Things got weird already on the first shift. A couple of the locals were sent back up after a few hours, and no one seemed to know why. One of the guys from another shift claimed they'd been found lying on the ground having some kind of seizure, but he hadn't seen it himself. Epilepsy or something, he shrugged. The gnome had suddenly stopped too, the operator refusing to drill any further. We aren't supposed to be here, he shouted hysterically as they dragged him out. He was replaced the next day. I just sat in my ditch, listening to music, slowly securing the membrane. I wasn't in a hurry, and since the gnome wasn't moving, there was no point in rushing it. Paul was in the ditch on the opposite end of the tunnel, but we'd meet up for a smoke every hour or so. We had started at the top, so we were slowly edging ourselves closer to the sink. It would probably take a week or so at this pace, however. The next day, one of the veterans of my shift was badly injured. Hank, I believe his name was. He somehow got his arm tangled in the steel arches supporting the membranes, and hung there, screaming for an hour or so before someone finally got him loose. The arm couldn't be saved, though. Last I heard, he was still in the hospital. Mental one now, though. He kept mumbling crazy stuff as they hurried him off to the ambulance. Teeth, he said. Too much teeth. This kept happening more or less daily, but the foreman didn't seem to care. People getting hurt in freak accidents, mumbling crazy stuff as they were carried out. Gnome operator after gnome operator being replaced without so much as an explanation. At the end of the first week, our shift was down to Paul, me, and a single veteran, Norm. We were all sitting around a table in the local bar, adjusting to our night shift in style, talking about the weird stuff that had happened. You guys don't get it, Norm said drunkenly. There's something down there. Shut the hell up, I said, shotting a vodka. It's just your mind buying tricks on you. Screw you, he spat. I know what I saw. I know what Hank saw. It wasn't normal. I'm not going down there again. I'm leaving tomorrow. What? Paul said. They're not going to let you do that. You'll lose your damn job. I don't care, Norm mumbled. I'll find something else. Better than ending up like Hank. There was something about the look in his eyes. Hollow, far away, frightened. I didn't believe him, of course. Couldn't believe him. Stupid story didn't make any sense. Some face poking out of the wall, featureless, misshapen, lots of teeth. There wasn't anything but teeth, Norm whispered. Grotesquely, oversized human teeth scared the living hell out of me. He kept his word, left the next day. The foreman yelled at him for half an hour, but he didn't care. Just dropped his gear right to the foreman's feet and walked out of the door. Paul and I stood there. We were the only ones left on the shift, but we had no clue what to do. We'd only been in the ditch so far, didn't know nothing about anything else. Just stay in the ditch, the foreman said. I'll have a new supervisor by the end of the week. So, we did. Inch by inch, we worked our way down towards the sink. The gnome ran sporadically, but mostly it just sat there idling. No one wanted to operate it. No one really could. It usually took weeks of training to even get the most basic understanding of it, but there weren't anyone around to teach it. They'd all either quit, gotten themselves horribly injured, or went stark raving mad. 
By the end of the week, even I started to question whether or not the money was worth it. Paul was acting really weird as well. I think it began when the deafening sound of the sink became the dominant soundscape. Even blasting my headphones at maximum volume wouldn't completely replace that eerie, hypnotizing mixture of water flowing and the machine pumping. Paul stopped meeting me for our hourly smoke breaks. I didn't see him for entire shifts, and when I did, he looked pale and worn, and his gaze seemed to go right through me. His eyes were shifty, and he would sweat and shiver convulsively. I tried talking to him, but he just mumbled incoherently, quickly retreating back to his room. Something was wrong, but I shrugged it off. Probably just a bug, a cold maybe, the flu, something of this world, something I could understand. People kept disappearing though. They couldn't hide it anymore. There were barely anyone left in the tunnels at all. The foreman wouldn't listen to a thing I said. He just threatened to fire me if I kept asking questions. Keep your questions to yourself, Murphy, he'd say. And keep your eyes on the ditch. I only had five days left of my shift. Then I'd have a couple of weeks off to recharge, recuperate, enjoy my big fat paycheck. Money talks, no doubt about it. I could make it. Five days, no sweat. I hadn't seen Paul for days. And as I sat there, in the darkness, listening to the droning of the sink, I felt something deep down that I just couldn't ignore. I don't know if it was fear exactly, but it was definitely fear related. I'd describe it as an extremely unnerving sensation of dread or an ominous premonition of some kind. Something was wrong. Something was different somehow. I crawled out from my ditch into the main tunnel, but nothing changed. The horrible feeling lingered. I decided to check on Paul. Maybe he had the same sensation. Maybe he felt it too. I crawled into the ditch on the other side, but soon found myself overcome by confusion. Paul was nowhere to be seen. But stranger still, it didn't look like he'd been doing any work. As far as I could tell, not a single part of the membrane was secure for several hundred yards. What the hell had he been doing down here for the last week? And where the hell was he? I crawled up and down the ditch, yelling his name. But there was no response. Nothing but the deafening, all-consuming sound of the pumps. I quickly realized there was only one place I hadn't looked. One place we weren't supposed to go. The sink itself. It was located on Paul's side of the tunnel. A small, cramped corridor running from the ditch for about 50 yards before it expanded into a vast chamber housing a deep pool of water and a massive pumping system. I'd only been there once on my very first day and we were strictly forbidden from going anywhere near it unsupervised. A single malfunction to the system could potentially bring the whole tunnel down and only trained engineers should operate it. Of course, we didn't have any trained engineers anymore. They were gone too. I nervously followed the corridor to the sink, desperately covering my ears. As I stood on the ledge overseeing the pool, I noticed something on the other side. By the pumps. Something I didn't see last time I was there. Something extremely bizarre. Something absurdly out of place. A door. A finely adorned white wooden door, like from a gothic mansion or something. The door didn't go into the rocky wall or anything. It just stood there, vertically, 
like someone had forgotten they'd left a damn door in the middle of the walkway. I slowly made my way around the pool, never letting the thing out of my sight. I just knew it had something to do with whatever was going on down here. Knew it had something to do with Paul. It had a strange, curved handle, with a misshapen figure carved at the end of it. I cautiously grabbed it, feeling a grim cold run all the way up my arm to my shoulder. I slowly opened it, expecting to see nothing but the rocky wall behind it, but immediately stepped back in shock as my mind slowly tried to comprehend what I was seeing. I can't really explain it, not in a way that makes sense, but the door led somewhere else. A long, narrow hallway stretched as far as the eye could see, and upon the smooth walls of it, I could see ancient runes, symbols, carvings, of which appeared completely unknown and alien to me. But what really got my attention was the blood. Deep pools of blood all over the ground. I continued to step back instinctively. As I did, I noticed something moving in the distance, something coming towards me at unnatural speed. I stepped back. It kept coming. Step back, coming. I could see it now, clear as day. It was moving erratically, abnormally, like it didn't will its own motion. Rather, it was convulsing, shuddering, spasming towards me. I have no idea how to describe the thing to do it justice. I'm not sure it's even possible. It was pale, misshapen, crooked and deformed, racing towards me on six spindly, tentacle-like appendages. But the face, the head, teeth, too much teeth, grotesquely oversized human teeth. I was frozen in fear as I watched it come closer and closer, drooling and shrieking discordantly. I quickly realized that I couldn't just retreat. I had to close it. I had to close the damn door. I stepped back into reality and bolted towards it. Moments before the creature reached it, reached me, I slammed it shut. But before it closed, just briefly, I saw something that horrified me even more than the creature itself dangling around its neck. A hard hat. Paul's hard hat. Look, I don't know what the hell happened down there. Was the creature Paul? Did the creature eat Paul? To me, it didn't matter. The thought of either sent shivers down my spine. So, I didn't hesitate. Didn't question it. Did the only thing that made sense I messed up the pumps. I figured a few well-placed strikes with a heavy wrench would do the trick, and it turned out I was right. A wailing alarm siren suddenly went off, accompanied by furious blinking lights. There was no time to waste. I ran as fast as my legs could bear me. I reached the surface about the same time as the tunnel collapsed behind me. The rising water devoured just about everything, and eventually, the structure just couldn't hold. I blamed everything on Paul. Couldn't find it in me to tell them the truth. Who the hell would believe me? I don't go near tunnels anymore, especially not subsea ones. I don't know what the hell we found down there, but I know it wasn't meant for this world. Son of a... I couldn't even get the words out before I slid across the ground, rolling in an attempt to keep my face and head from hitting the ground. The impact jarred my neck, 
making me feel dizzy as spots danced before my eyes. My dog's leash flew from my hand as my glasses flew off my face. In a desperate attempt to make sure I didn't go over the 10 foot drop that I'd fallen toward, I grabbed at roots and grass, managing to keep myself upright, half my body over the edge and looking down at rocks and tree roots. Worse yet, there was a filthy creek that had flooded from the recent rain. My dog, Bumper, had started to pull on me during our nightly walk, probably seeing a squirrel or a rabbit and deciding to give chase. I used to be able to pull him back to my side, until three months of growth and endless puppy energy came crashing into my dog's body. Once I was sure I wasn't going to fall, I managed to find my footing, squinting at the blurs of green and brown around me. I called for him a few times, even whistling. I heard a yelp, followed by a whine. My heart was a battering ram against my chest as I called a few more times, running toward the direction of the noises, further up the creek and drop. Then, I saw a grey and brown blur as he came rushing towards me. The lack of noise startled me. Bumper's collar had multiple tags, constantly jingling when he walked. This little run hadn't been the first time I had to look for him in the dark. Not so bad in the summer, a pain in the ass in the dead of winter. His tail was blurrier as he wagged it back and forth, looking up at me. I looked for his leash, frowning when I saw that it wasn't around his neck anymore. Asshole, I snapped at him, before groping around for my glasses. He said nothing, just sat next to me and wagged his long tail, panting heavily. The run must have taken a lot out of him. At least that meant I would get a night's rest without him moving around too much. Even with the full moon glaring through the canopy above, there wasn't enough light for me to see my glasses, which were black. Nice going past me. Not even enough to catch a glint of light in the lenses. After a few moments of shining around my cell phone's flashlight, I shook my head. If they had gone over the drop, there was no way I would find them in the dark. I'd have to come back in the morning and hope I hadn't broken them or lost them for good. Bumper stayed by my side as I held my phone's screen up to my nose, quickly ordering a new pair of glasses online. They say hindsight is 2020. I should have seen something like this coming. The near-sighted and short-sighted jokes were endless with me. When we got back to my old apartment, I noticed Bumper had stayed at the bottom of the steps, staring up at the door frames with a quizzical look. His head was tilting side to side, his tail no longer wagging, just staying between his legs. Come on! I reached down and grabbed him by the scruff of his neck. His fur pushed against my tore open skin, making me wince. I pulled him up a couple of steps before I let go of him and looked at my hand seeing it was covered with dirt. I shot him a dirty look. I would scraped my palms when I fell, so I had reopened the wounds when I grabbed him, and my hands smeared with blood. You rolled around in the dirt, too. My hands shook with anger as I inhaled sharply. I was in no mood to give him a bath that night. He also reeked now that I was close enough to smell him. God, what had he chased after? A skunk and a pig wrestling in a pile of corpses? So I went inside, waiting for him to follow me. He did so reluctantly, giving my hands a rather vigorous, apologetic lick when he did so. I winced as his teeth scraped against the wound. Once he was inside, I shut and locked my door, taking care to turn the lock twice and check it against the train. I kept to my phone, trying to do a quick reorder of what the tumble had cost me, and had to make sure I had spares if something like this should happen again. A couple more clicks, and I had ordered him a new collar, leash, and tags. After quickly cleaning myself up in the bathroom, I stared at my reflection for a few moments. The fall hadn't banged me up too bad. Just a few scrapes and cuts, 
that would take a week or two to heal. After washing my face in a quick shower, I went back to my bedroom just in time to see Bumper go under the bed. I hoped I hadn't scared him by yelling. I peered under the bed, the shadow making it impossible to see him under it. You want to snuggle tonight? No answer. I made a few kissing noises and snapped my fingers as I beckoned to him. Guilt formed a pit in my stomach. Maybe... Maybe I had scared him with my yelling. I threw myself onto the bed and pulled the blankets up to my chin, quickly falling asleep after selecting some music to sleep to. I slept fitfully, worry for Bumper and my lost glasses weighing in my mind. What if they had broken when they fell? What if some creep had seen me feeling around for them and thought I was easy prey? What if I hadn't been able to find Bumper and he'd gotten hurt? What if I yelled at him too harshly and he wouldn't want to take that trail anymore? What if he had gotten a disease from whatever he'd chased? The next morning came too quickly. I had to fight to escape the entanglement of blankets that I'd cocooned myself in. I was dressing for the morning walk, finding some old rope to use as a leash. I shook my keys loudly, expecting Bumper to come out running, nearly knocking me over as he managed to hit the back of my knees. Silence greeted me. Bumper? I walked back into my bedroom. Kneeling on the ground, I looked under my bed, unable to see in the darkness underneath. I could see the black silhouette of my dog, his tail thumping loudly against the wall and bed frame. He began to pant heavily again, but stayed put where he was. Come on! I patted the ground a few times, trying to coax him out. He stayed where he was, tail thumping loudly and panting. When I tried to reach in and pull him out, he let out a growl that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. I quickly retracted my arm. Groaning, I pushed myself back up, walking towards the door. I even tried fake leaving, expecting him to come bolting out when he realized I'd shut the door. Nothing. Fine. If you pee on the floor, you're dead, I joked as I left the apartment. I had to find my glasses. There was no way I would be able to get to work without them. I followed the route Bumper and I had been using for the past six months. I was honestly surprised my feet hadn't made their own trail. As I walked, I was careful to tread lightly today, stopping to squint at the grass in the hopes my glasses would be there. Finally... I managed to find them. They hadn't gone over the drop at all. They were resting in the grass. A few scratches, but otherwise fine. When I put them back on, I felt relief wash over me. As I looked around, I smiled. Then, I felt the guilt of all the times I'd snapped a bumper come washing over me. I'd have to get him a few extra treats to say sorry. I was about to leave when I saw the bright red flash of fabric moving back and forth in the creek. Pausing, I ventured down the drop and walked over to it, recognizing Bumper's leash. I reached into the filthy water, pulling it out. It resisted. I tugged harder, thinking it was snagged under a rock or on a tree branch. I saw it was still hooked around something. The familiar jingling of tags made me pause. Had I managed to find what I'd lost yesterday? I was almost giddy as I pulled the leash towards me. There was a wet slap as something hit one of the rocks on the bank of the creek. I paused, staring at it for a few seconds as my brain tried to piece together what the hell I was looking at. It was pink and scabbed, with ears and a tail. I saw a few tufts of grey and brown fur that made me fall back hard against the rock, the tags around its neck. Red Bumper.
My name is Dash Robinson, and I was employed for the better part of two decades by an organization formerly known as ECHO, which stood for Expansive Cybernetics for Human Occupants. We put on the front of being a medical team, humanely searching for cures to humanity's ailments, as well as proactively perfecting artificial limbs and organs for hospitals. In reality, what we really did was far more sinister. We took in the people that the world didn't love, the homeless, runaways, mentally ill, even trafficking victims, and we conducted live experiments on them. We were funded by another, higher, even shadier organization, and were given complete freedom in our studies. We were a relatively large team, about 300 of us, and we each had extensive study in our own individual medical fields. Our head of personnel was a man by the name of Stephen Ettermeyer. We were sworn to secrecy about the happenings at our Echo facility, and the happenings were aggressive and constant. We wanted to see how different types of artificial hearts worked, so we ripped out still beating hearts and tested our own mechanisms to see if they could actually sustain life. We put metallic stomachs in people's bellies, tore out fingernails and replaced them with plastic ones, cut off and replaced so many limbs you wouldn't believe it. The screams and utter agony of our test subjects got to me at first. I would like to think that it got to Ellie, my lover, and all of the other scientists and doctors as well. But after nearly 20 years, I've become desensitized to human suffering. We all believed that what we were doing was right, that every life lost was a necessary sacrifice for the future glory of humanity. But things weren't going smoothly. We wanted to see the way our cybernetic enhancements worked in the entirety of a human subject's life, starting from the day they were born. Ellie had a sister, Faith, who was a complete failure compared to herself. She had been kicked out by her parents due to being a young alcoholic and straight-up troublemaker in the community. Ellie procured her for us, and that was when Project Algos began. One of our scientists, a young, fit and healthy male called Dr. Stafford, impregnated Faith, and we began our careful study of her. No modifications were made to Faith herself. She wasn't the main subject of this particular project. Her unborn child was. After taking very good care of Faith during her term, we delivered a healthy, six-pound baby boy. Faith called him Adam. We didn't care what he was called. We allowed the child to live in the chamber with his mother for the first eight months of his life. Then we separated them and did our first modification. We removed the child's left foot and replaced it with a model made of flexible material, which, under our manipulation, was meant to grow and lengthen in accordance with the child's other limbs. We cut Adam off formula milk and began feeding him our own concoction, composed of nutrients we deemed a more healthy alternative for humanity, though still yet to be tested. By the time Adam was three, we had already removed his right ear, right lung, left thumb, and the aforementioned left foot. Every appendage had been replaced by a model of our own, and, so far, Adam was fully responsive and, if anything, more prosperous than a regular child. He was already reading and completing puzzles meant for children much older by the time he was four years old. His mother, though apprehensive about our experiments on him, seems proud whenever she got to see him. Dr. Ettermeyer was even more proud of our research team as a whole. We gave the child a pet rabbit when he turned eight. We studied his interactions with it for six months before euthanizing the animal before his eyes. Adam showed no sign of sorrow in those grey eyes of his. We were most impressed. If humans could eventually evolve to live without emotion, Ettermeyer summarized, there would be nothing that could ever hinder our advancement as a species as a whole. Adam was 11 when we took his tongue and replaced it with a yellow, sponge-like organ that we believed would be far more recipient to taste 
than any human tongue could be. Adam didn't disappoint. He seemed to relish every single bite he took, every single sip of water. It was as though he was living in ecstasy. The only side effect, however, was that he couldn't talk anymore. He only nodded or shook his head whenever we asked him questions. Though Ellie initially objected to it, the decision was made to see how a greater attachment than the rabbit suddenly being severed would affect Adam's behavior. The only other physical and emotional attachment he had was his mother, Ellie's sister, Faith, who had grown to cooperate with us after all these years. While we had taken the peaceful and clean route with ending the rabbit, Faith's destruction was, by design, efficiently violent. Both her legs were broken and she was shot in the head right in front of Adam. Droplets of blood splattered his face, but Adam did not mourn or even look at a corpse. Instead, he turned his back to us and returned to his favorite hobby, drawing. We introduced Adam to lewd images when he was 14. When he was 16, we removed his bits, replacing them with our own enhancements. Replicating the male sex drive proved to be one of our toughest endeavors, but Adam was able to use it and produce the false semen at an even healthier rate than before. Though he was now sterile, we summarized that we could actually add one's actual testosterone to the mechanical organ one day. An organ that would never malfunction or contract or spread disease. Dr. Etemeyer threw a celebratory party the night before Adam's 18th birthday. We were all so ecstatic. We had nourished and supplemented a human being from the time he was conceived all the way to his adulthood. At this point, we believed that we were God. To Adam, we probably were. At this point, he was more machine than man, both inside and out. 90% of his internal organs were produced by Echo. His left foot, right ear, right eyeball, left thumb, right hand, right lower leg, and replaced it with more receptive grafts made from mixtures of certain animal hides. Even Adam's blood had slowly been filtered and was now about a 50-50 mixture of the blood he had been born with and new blood, blood created to combat other human diseases by our research team. Adam had even prospered physically from our control over every aspect of his life. He towered at a height of 6'9", taller than anyone else in Ellie's family. He would never be athletic, but he was wickedly intelligent and even clever. We had done far more good for him than he would ever realize. I remember announcing to everyone at the party that Ellie and I were expecting there was applause all around, and I kissed her as we stood at the center of attention. Project Algos was going perfectly, and our funding, as well as salaries, had increased drastically over the years. Everything in life was great. And then, the clock struck twelve. No one noticed the single door to the conference chamber being opened, no one saw him until he had lumbered for about a minute. But when we finally did, a sudden silence fell in the room, like a great shadow cast over a burning fire. Adam stood before us, a giant among men, six foot nine and packed with 290 pounds of muscle. His one artificial eye, which was red as opposed to grey, didn't blink like his other eye did but he was looking at all of us. His perpetual frown we all knew so well, disgracing his face. Did someone let him out? Asked Dr. Etemeyer after several long seconds of painful silence. Wesley? Trina? No, Stephen. We never even went to see him today. Dr. Etemeyer slowly approached Adam, along with Wesley and Trina, his primary caretakers, he had never given us any issue, but this was still surreal. None of us had ever seen him outside of his chamber. Adam, what on earth are you doing out of your chamber? 
asked Dr. Etemeyer. It was supposed to be a rhetorical question, but Adam answered. Today is my birthday. Etemeyer froze, as did Wesley and Trina. It would have been less surprising for a spirit to have suddenly appeared and spoken to us. But this... This was not supposed to be happening. Adam turned his head slowly to the left, making eye contact with Dr. Stafford. Father. Stafford dropped his drink, the glass shattering on the floor. Adam reached out and stuck both hands in Dr. Etemeyer's mouth. He yanked up with his left hand and down with his right, ripping apart the old man's jaws. Etemeyer fell to the floor, convulsing and Adam sees Trina, twisting her head and breaking her neck. He then picked up Wesley like he were a rag doll, and threw him at the first person who had made a run for the door. Wesley's head connected with the runners at high speed, and both went sprawling to the floor. Others tried to make a run for it, but Adam, it turned out, could run after all, and faster than any of us. He was in front of the door in an instant, grabbing two people by the heads and smashing them together, sending blood gushing in every direction. People screamed and ran, but there were no windows in this room. Adam began stalking about, ripping off limbs and ending lives. Those who could make it to the door did, but they were far and few. Ellie and I hid behind a table and watched as Adam seized Dr. Stafford by the throat and threw him down to the floor. Why? A co-worker wailed in a high-pitched voice, a puddle forming beneath him. Adam had been leaning down to hit him, but he suddenly paused. His dispassionate expression did not change, however. He knelt and brushed Dr. Stafford's hair from his face, then offered a hand and helped him stand up. Do you love me, father? Stafford was crying as he nodded like a bobblehead. Of course I do, son. Of course I do. Adam smiled. His teeth, brilliant and white, had never been touched by us. He took Stafford into his arms and hugged him tight and tighter and tighter. Ellie and I watched in horror as Adam squeezed Stafford close, breaking every bone in his body. Blood ran from Stafford's nose and eye sockets as his offspring ended him. Our offspring. Ellie and I made a run for it. Adam glanced back at us, but kept his attention on crushing Dr. Stafford. I could see broken bones jutting out of his skin. That was nearly two weeks ago. I have no idea what happened to the facility and I haven't been contacted by any of the higher-ups. I do know one thing, though. He has been... finding us somehow. I've seen four of my former co-workers on the news having been murdered in, quote, grisly manners. Ellie went to a yoga class with her friends and, according to them, was carried off by a behemoth. Her body still hasn't turned up. As for me... I would leave my house, stay in a hotel maybe, or go on the run, but I know that it is pointless. I know that he will find me, like he did the others before me. I don't know if Adam hates us, or is angry, or if he's even capable of emotion. I just know that, if he is capable, then he should be grateful. We made him into the perfect being. Each day, I wake up and follow my normal routine for getting ready, just like everyone else. I get out of bed, go eat some breakfast, brush my teeth, shave if I need to, get dressed and fix my hair. Though sometimes I forget to do things, grab my watch, bring some extra cash for a movie, 
and other small things, sometimes important things. Probably more often than the average person. I've talked to doctors about it, and some have tried prescribing medication to help, but I either got used to them and continued forgetting things, or they had some nasty side effects, like having to go to the bathroom all the time. One doctor suggested that, instead of trying to use medicine to help combat my forgetfulness, that I just write myself notes. Obviously, I had tried something similar. I made myself lists for in the morning, but I kept forgetting things that I needed to do as I write them down the night before. Their response was to try using sticky notes as I remember things I need to do and place them in places like the bathroom, where I spend a large portion of my routine, instead of just on a piece of paper. A fresh perspective is sometimes all you need. I tried this method for months. I felt less stress when it came to life in general. I was getting my work done on time and with better results. My boss, Cheryl, even told me she liked the improvement in my work ethic and was glad to see me doing better. She even discussed the possibility of me getting a promotion if I kept up the good work. My friends also talked about how good I was doing with remembering things. Tristan, my best friend of 17 years, was especially proud I remembered we were all meeting up to hang out that day. Anna thanked me after I complimented her hair, saying that I remembered she told me she was planning to go out and get it done, as it was her celebrating 30 days of being sober. My brother, Jason, was especially glad to see me remember things after watching me struggle to remember things for years on end. Of course, I don't always have moments where I look at a note and go, oh yeah, I needed to do this. Sometimes it's just, oh, I didn't realize I needed to do this, but I wrote the note to myself so it must be important. Some of these moments consisted of, don't forget to ask Cheryl about giving you extra time for writing up that report. Drop by that party tonight at Tristan's place at 10 p.m., don't forget the beer you promised to bring. And talk to Jess about how her fiancé is doing. She's going to get remarried. Which all seem like things that could have happened. Like I said, my memory isn't the best. All of them seemed a bit off though. I just couldn't place why it felt off. I thought nothing of it and went through with them all. When I talked to Cheryl about extending the time for my report that was due... She gave me a look and said, Are you joking? I was pretty confused, and it must have shown because she followed with, I know your memory isn't that great, but I assigned that report a week ago, and it was simply copying the information into your report, and you want me to extend the time you need to work on it, so you come to me the day it's due? I was thoroughly confused by this point. I didn't even remember seeing a note to write my report. Cheryl, please listen to me. I wrote myself a note asking to extend the report date. I don't even remember being told to write the report. I swore I wrote a note to do so now that I think about it, but I didn't see it. I was hoping Cheryl would have mercy on me and forgive me for this little mistake. I promise I can have it to you tomorrow. Tomorrow? You want to turn this report in tomorrow? Nathan, this report was due today for a reason. I was told by my boss to assign one of the employees that report and have them turn it into him by tonight. When you came in, I was going to pull you aside for a moment to give you his email to send it to him. I was going to have someone higher up do it, but I trusted that you had the capability to do so. I can clearly see now that this was a mistake. Cheryl took a breath and went for the mug on her desk. I could see the stress on her face. I'm so sorry. I can do it now if you'd like. I can work all night if I have to. No, that won't be necessary. I'll deal with the consequences of assigning a report to someone who clearly had no business doing it. Get out of my office. I just nodded my head and made my way out the door, ready to continue on with the day, knowing my promotion wasn't going to happen anytime soon after this blunder. One more thing, Nathan. I looked back to her and asked, Yes, Cheryl? You're fired. I left the office and packed my stuff and left. I sat in my car for a bit, beating myself up, 
and wondering where that note went. I had no idea what happened to my note telling me to write the report. Not until I saw it in the trash once I got home, tore up into little pieces. Later that night, I tried putting the fact that I'd just lost my job out of my head, hyping myself up for Tristan's party. We hadn't done anything like this since our time in college, and I was excited to feel young again. I stopped by the liquor store and picked up a case of beer. Something cheap, but still a decent taste. Just like Tristan and I's college days. After I picked up the beer, I pulled up to his house. In his driveway were a few cars. Some people had already arrived, but I knew he wouldn't care. I was the one bringing the beer after all. I glanced over Anna's car and thought she was cool with us drinking and would have something else instead. I was proud of her for sticking to her AA meetings and becoming sober. I knocked on Tristan's door and instead of having his party face on, he had a somber face and a sad smile as he saw me. Thanks for coming. I know it's been hard for all of us, especially Anna. I'm glad she asked for help though. Everyone else is here. I guess you got busy with work. Sorry, but we already started talking without you. She thought it was too important to wait. She said she'd been slipping and getting the urge to... drink. His voice trailed as he looked down in my hand at the case of beer. He was silent for a moment, then said, Is this some kind of joke to you? I stammered out a response. No, I thought you were throwing a party. That's what my note was. You said to bring beer? A party? Our friend is struggling with alcohol. So you thought I would throw a party and ask you to bring beer? That's disgusting. Jesus, I... Leave the beer in the car. We'll talk more about this after we help Anna. I could tell Tristan was furious. I felt horrible. I didn't even want to think about Anna's problem. After the meeting, which lasted about half an hour, apparently, Anna had nearly broke her 30 days of being sober. She said she got blackout drunk the other night. I just felt so stressed and needed something to help cope, as she put it. We told Anna we'd be there for her and would continue to support her, but she had to be the one to put the bottle down, as friends are supposed to do. Once everyone left, Tristan closed the door and looked at me. So, what you're telling me is that you somehow misconstrued Anna needs help tonight. Can you be here around 8pm? It has to do with her drinking. And to top it off, you showed up two hours late. Nathan, you better have been working on something pretty important because Anna needed us. You're like a brother to her. And to not have you there for two hours... Wanting to know that you would be there made her heart break. She waited an hour for you, but we told her she needed to start this meeting now. I just stared, realizing how badly I screwed up. Are you going to stand there with a blank look on your face, or are you going to explain yourself? I swear my note said... I started, but Tristan wasn't having any of it. Oh, here we go again. My note said, I never once said anything about a party or bringing alcohol. Do you realize that Anna saw you with that beer? After the meeting and you stood in the kitchen waiting for me, she confronted me about it. I have never seen her in such pain. You really messed up tonight. Tristan was pacing the floor. If looks could kill, I would have been dead on the floor. Nathan, I'm going to have to ask you to leave before I hit you and write a note yourself reminding to apologize to Anna, and don't screw this one up. Tristan, please, listen to me. I didn't mean to hurt Anna. I promise, I pleaded. Tristan just pointed at the door, no words being spoken. The silent fury of my best friend, who probably now hated me. I left his home and closed the door, knowing I'd probably not talk to him again for a while. After I got home, I pulled out my phone, ready to call Anna and apologize. I saw the time, though, 
and decided against it. It was late, and she was probably tired. Instead, I wrote a note to myself. Call Anna and apologize for last night. As I walked around, I saw another torn up note. This one telling me about going to Tristan's house to help Anna. Two notes, both destroyed. Who could have been doing this? It didn't matter at the moment. I had to see Jess, my ex-wife, tomorrow. The next day, after I woke up and followed my morning routine, I started getting dressed for work, but then realized I'd been fired. I then thought about texting Tristan to see if he wanted to help me go job hunting, but remembered we had a big argument. I couldn't remember what it was exactly, but I knew I screwed up horribly. After I decided that I should browse online for a new job, I saw the note I left for myself, reminding me of my meeting with Jess. I texted her a quick message, asking if she still wanted to meet up today, and asking if she had any place in mind. Her reply came a few minutes after I continued browsing possible jobs. She said meeting at the cafe in town seemed like a good idea. It sounded good to me, getting some coffee, a little bit of food, and talking with her. Jess and I rarely got to talk. She got busy after our divorce, doing amazing things with her life, while I struggled to remember basic things. Jess used to help me remember everything, but I guess that's one of the reasons we got divorced. I may not remember a lot, but I remember how she felt. She said, I don't even feel like we're married. I feel like I'm just your living calendar. I get up and you always ask me what you have to do that day. Nathan, I can't live like this. Jess then went away for a week while I tried to remember everything on my own. I don't blame her for disappearing. She wanted me to do better. And I couldn't. Anyone in her shoes would have left. Shortly after that week, we started the process to get divorced. That was five years ago. We stayed in contact, still trying to be friends. We don't talk as much as I would like to, but as always, Jess is busy. It always amazed me how she could keep up with so much. I was doing somewhat better with my memory now than I was then. After she texted me the location, I grabbed my keys, phone and wallet, headed out the door to meet up with her. I wanted to make sure I was on time. I knew that part of how I screwed up last night was that I was late. If I was early, Jess couldn't be mad at me for being late. Once I got to the cafe, I saw that Jess wasn't there. No problem, I thought. I'll just wait and look at jobs until she gets here. I ended up waiting about an hour, with no luck in finding any jobs. Hey Nathan, I'm glad you're here already. Memory getting better? Is how Jess greeted me after she walked into the cafe. I got up and hugged her, per the norm of our previous meetings. I felt her arms wrap around me, and she felt so warm. Her hugs always felt like that. I knew that her hugs were usually quick, but as I went to pull away, she pulled me in tighter. I let it happen, and let go when she was ready. I've been trying to work on it. I'm now leaving sticky notes everywhere in my house. Things seem to be doing better though. How are you? I asked her, hoping that she would say she was doing good too. I couldn't remember why, but I think our last conversation, she was sad. Oh, I'm trying my best. Things have been hard, with what happened with Price and all. Getting through the day though. I had no idea what happened to Price. I knew he was just very sick. How is Price doing? I know he was sick. Guessing things got worse? It should be no surprise that this was not a good response. These notes I had left for myself continually screwed me over. How? Was all Jess said. I was confused and asked what she meant. Her response was, How? How could you forget that Price died a month ago? I told you in person. 
I can't believe this. You're an absolute ass, Nathan. An absolute ass. Jess grabbed her stuff and just left me in the cafe. I didn't even try to apologise. There was no way I could apologise for something as severe as that. All I could think was, I am a horrible person. I left the cafe quietly and returned to my house, knowing there was no way in hell Jess would ever talk to me again. After I got home, I looked for more notes on what to do today, along with a possible note that may have been destroyed. This incident sparked me remembering that there were notes that had been torn up. I found two notes that I thought were important. One said, Call Anna today. Thank her for coming to Tristan's party, even though there was drinking, and tell her you're proud for not drinking during the party. And one that was torn up. Meet up with Jess today. She said she needed to talk about Price's death. This was when I realised something was wrong. I knew for a fact at this point that I did not write that note to call Anna and thank her. I wrote one to apologise because I thought there was a party and she saw the beer in my hand. The night was somewhat hazy, but the important parts were clear enough. I tore the note telling me to call Anna into pieces and then texted her, saying I wanted to meet up to talk to apologise in person. She didn't respond right away. I could understand why. From what it seemed like to her, I was just tempting her. I decided to let her be and decide if she felt I was worth her time responding to. After I set my phone down, I knew my chances of her saying something was pretty slim. I got on with my day though. I continued checking around the house for notes. Not my daily ones reminding me to do basic tasks. I saw the one to look at some jobs, some more, and one that said, Pick up your gun that you bought in case of an intruder. I couldn't remember going out to buy a gun, but with my memory that was seemingly getting worse suddenly, and it being probably months ago at that point, but apparently it was time to go get a gun. Break-ins had apparently been on the rise in the past year. Tristan recommended I get a gun in case of an intruder. I didn't think anything would happen to me, but better safe than sorry. The drive there was unpleasant. I couldn't get all the mistakes I made out of my head. I basically screwed over my life in a matter of two days, all because of a couple of notes I had made for myself. Once I picked up the gun, with the normal pleasantries that come with receiving one, I drove home. At least on the drive back, I didn't think of how much I screwed up. Instead, I thought about the notes. The ones that had been thrown away and torn up, then replaced with notes. Where did they come from? Did I really write them? If so, why would I want to destroy my life? I don't hate myself. I'm not my biggest fan, but I don't want to ruin everything good in my life, is what I thought. A number of scenarios ran through my head, all of them terrifying. I ended up getting myself very worked up. As soon as I got pulled into my driveway, I grabbed my gun and the ammo I bought with it rushed inside, locked my door, and went around to check that every door in the house was locked. I checked each individual lock to make sure they weren't tampered with. There were no clear signs of a break-in. How would I be able to tell if someone was able to pick the lock though? They could have closed and locked the door, so I was none the wiser. I removed the gun from its case, inspecting it some, and loaded it. I then stuck it under my pillow whole sleep with a gun routine. Being scared, I grabbed my phone and decided to call Tristan to inform of everything that happened. As I went to grab my phone, it started ringing. Lo and behold, it was Tristan. I didn't know why he was calling, but I was glad that he was because I wanted someone else to know what was going on. Hello, Tristan, are you there? is how I started off the conversation, ready to rush into what I needed to say. Yeah. His voice was quiet. The sadness in his voice was clearly evident, and it seemed like he had been crying. I'm here. Listen, we need to talk. 
You are so right we do. I'm freaking out, Tristan. My notes have been torn up and replaced. I don't know who's been doing it and... and... I spoke a mile a minute, fearing something may happen if I didn't tell him soon. Whoa, whoa, whoa. S slow down, Nathan. What? Listen, we can get to that in a minute. I think what I have to say takes precedence. Okay, okay, I'm listening. I'm sure he could hear the anxiousness in my voice. So, Anna, she, uh... Jesus, how do I say this? Tristan seemed concerned and on the verge of tears again. Anna died last night, Nathan. She apparently drank herself to death. She just kept drinking and drinking. Police said there were bottles everywhere. I felt my mouth go dry. Anna was dead. And the last thing I heard from her was at a meeting where she needed help with a problem. What did I do? Show up with the very thing that was causing her to head on a downward spiral. I couldn't help but feel responsible for her death. Tristan continued. I know you might need a minute. Call me back when you process things more. It's a lot to take in. Goodbye, Nathan. You're still my friend. Then there was the click of a phone and just silence. I set my phone down, pushing every paranoia out of my head. I put my hands in my face and just cried until I couldn't cry anymore. After I regained my composure somewhat, I grabbed my phone and opened up my contacts list. There was nothing there. I checked my call logs and saw they were deleted. I couldn't remember Tristan's number. That's why it was in my contacts. I tried recalling it, but all that came up was blanks. I went to check on any online messaging apps I may have. I found that I had none. They were all deleted off my phone, along with any social media platforms I was on. I had no way of contacting anyone. I couldn't remember any of their numbers. The only number I could remember was 911. And what was I supposed to tell them? My phone has mysteriously wiped off all my data after I got told a friend of mine died. I also can't remember what has been happening to my notes to remind me of what to do and have figured out that they're being replaced with ways to ruin my life. They would think it was some sick joke. I threw my phone across the room in frustration. I watched it break against the wall. Immediately, regret washed over me. There was still a chance I could have remembered someone's phone number and called for help. Too late for that now, though. Not wanting to deal with anything I'd just experienced, I crawled into my room and into my bed. I couldn't sleep. I didn't expect to. I was just hoping for some comfort, but none came. Eventually, I passed out, sleeping for only a few hours, but I didn't wake up in my bed. I woke up on the couch. My gun was in my hand. I chalked it up to sleepwalking. That's what it was. I'm under a lot of stress. It's just sleepwalking and my paranoia. It became a mantra. Just sleepwalking and paranoia. Just sleepwalking and paranoia. The mantra stopped working. After I read a new note though. Don't forget to kill yourself. I read it over at least five times. Wanted to make sure I read it properly. Every time it was the same words. I tore up the note, not wanting to look at it anymore. Especially with Anna's passing, it was too much. I would have done the same thing if I wasn't paranoid. Anyone in the right state of mind would have. After I tore it up, I picked up the pieces and stuck them in one hand, gun in the other hand. I threw the pieces away and saw another note over the trash can. Don't forget to kill yourself. I tore this one up too, getting more worried. This made me wonder how many of these notes there actually were. I went around the house and all of my normal notes were replaced. 
Don't forget your watch. To kill yourself was right on my bathroom mirror. This made me scream and rush into my room. I locked my door and laid my gun down on my bed. I cried for a good few hours, afraid to leave my room, afraid to try and get help. I had done this to myself. Or, more accurately, I had done this to myself. I still hadn't figured out what was going on. As of my writing this, two days have passed since I've locked myself in my room, too afraid to leave. I'm scared. More scared than I've ever been in my life. And I'm so tired. But I can't sleep. I'm too afraid. I know I'm going to pass out soon though. Frankly, I hope I don't wake up so I can end this nightmare. To say the thought to use that gun hasn't crossed my mind is a lie. Maybe after I wake up after passing out, I'll consider it more seriously or have the energy to actually do it. Or maybe I'm in hell and this is my punishment for whatever I did. If this is hell, Killing myself won't do much, if anything, very likely. But if this isn't hell, and it's all real, it may just be the way out. I'll sleep on it. Not like I have any choice. I can barely write anymore. Don't forget to kill yourself, Nathan. <laughs>